Well, hello, everybody. Uh, the computer tells me it's showtime, and I always obey everything the computer tells me. So uh, thank you for tuning in for another week of Self-Publishing Insiders. We always love having you. Uh, as always, we've got an amazing guest. And if you have questions, please pop them into the comments. Uh, we will get to them at some point. We've got little uh, draft to digital gremlins floating around in there uh, to answer anything you ask. So uh, don't be afraid to ask anything, and we'll help you out in any way we can. But the real reason we're all gathered here today is our guest, Angela Bull, who is the IBPA CEO, as her screen, her uh, tag will tell you. And I got it right on the first try, Angela. I think you did. I did not hear an IPBA in there. Yeah. I'm going to get that wrong at least once uh, in the broadcast. So uh, we'll make a drinking game of it. <laughs> it's all it's uh it's already noon here in uh in uh, central time zone in texas so uh it's you're allowed to drink that's when i that's what i was raised to believe yeah. so Seems thank fair. you for being a part of the show I'm, I'm really glad to have, have you here thanks yeah i'm looking forward to it yeah definitely all the questions all, all the questions publishing yeah absolutely and you are of course a very busy person so um in a very busy organization um but that let's start there because I don't know if everyone is fully aware of what IBPA is. See, no drink. You can't take a drink. I got it right. Oh, yeah. again. You don't see, you don't know what's in the cup. You don't know. What's in the cup. <laughs> That's right. So, so uh, can you kind of give us a, a just a quick, you know, overview sure. of what the organization is? Sure, sure. Um, IBPA. So uh, the acronym is the Independent Book Publishers Association. Um, so we're definitely here for self-published authors. Um, it's part of our membership. We serve independent publishers across the board, uh, you know, whether you're the largest size, like a learner or source books, or if you're a single book self-published author who's getting into the industry and trying to figure out how to do so professionally. Um, our mission is to lead and serve independent publishers through advocacy, education, and tools for success. We've got uh, just over 4,000 members that we lead in that way and serve in that way. Um, and yeah, so we've been around since 1983, a trade association, really just here to help uh, independent publishers of all stripes to do well. 1983, in that was, sorry, 1983 <laughs> was a very different landscape from, from what it is now. I mean, even in the last five years, we have to, you know, massive changes and a huge yeah. in landscape, but for sure. I mean, imagine publishing with no desktop computer. I always think about that. And yeah. we had a fax machine in our office until like five years ago. So, yeah. <laughs> were you still getting faxes? We were getting like advertisements. Like it That's was it. somebody in the world was sending faxes through, but it was like advertising for things. I think it's time yeah. travel. Yeah. <laughs> I think you were basically you were receiving advertisements from 1983 is what yeah. was happening. It was um, <laughs> yeah. That's, it, you know, it's remarkable. Um I mean, technology obviously has changed. What, what are some other things you have seen changed, you know, in relation to the organization? Like helping authors in 1983 has, has to have been very different than helping authors today. <laughs> it has yeah, to well, look different. Well, IBPA too. I mean, I, we, we have always served author publishers, but not to the extent that we serve them today because yeah. the technology of the day has really increased the number of, of author publishers. You yeah. know, it's the, the ability and the technology, the technology available to publish has lowered the entry, the bar of entry to publishing to lots and lots of different people. Yeah. So I'd say one of the biggest changes was, you know, the conversations were more big ticket supply chain type things, you know, back yeah. in the day when you're publishing at offset printing and sending things to your through your distributor. And we still talk a lot about that. Yeah. Um, but there's kind of a different conversation when you're, you know, you're working through a uh, author publisher space and you're, you're not really working in the, the distribute with the distributors and kind of trying to work through that. So, right. yeah, I think that's changed. Um, about 33% of our membership are self-published authors at this point in time. So there's a lot of conversations about that. Yeah. How, how did, uh, publishing on demand shift things for you guys? Well, great. In terms of our membership, it really raised the number of self-published authors. Um, it, I mean, not to be too uncomfortable in the space, but it, it, it lowered the bar. It, did, it lowered the yeah. standard of publishing a lot. So our, it, it, it removed the barrier to entry. It that's, removed that's the barrier to entry. Way. <laughs> <laughs> so we found that our the need for us to be to lean into the education aspect of our mission really yeah. increased a lot, and and you know not for nothing in terms of like it's not like people were uh, maliciously trying to just 
get around all the different standards and stuff. It's just, you know, I don't know how to fix a car. Right. You told me I had to fix my car. I would definitely mess that up too. So it was just a lot of people that were kind of walking into the and thinking it would be a little bit easier to get it done. And uh, it's not that easy, really. I mean, it's, yeah. it's pretty easy to kind of put content up, but to be a publisher and to really make that content sell and to really reach your reader, that's not a really easy thing to do. So definitely we saw that, you know, we had to pick up the education piece and run with it. Yeah. So where, uh, what are the like basic foundational tips then? Uh, cause you, you're right. It's not easy to be a publisher. Almost anyone can, can publish at yeah. this point. Uh, yeah. so there's no barrier to entry there, but in order to be successful at it, what do you think are foundational principles that people should know about? Well, we do publish something uh, called the industry standards checklist for a professionally published book, which okay. is a very long title. Um, but what that document, um, it's a long title for a two page document that essentially just talks to you about what we used to call book in hand concepts. Yeah. So I think the content itself needs to be great, obviously, and that's something that we can't really get into too much at IVPA because we're not going to read all the different books. But what we can talk about is how do you put a book together so that it's clearly professionally published? Um, yeah. so that has to do with a lot of really weird nitpicky things that the publishing industry has agreed with itself that they're important for yeah. some reason, this, that, and the other. Like, what do you put on the spine of a book? How do you include blurbs on the back of the book? Where do you put your author bio? And I think a lot of the tells on a, a book that's not going to be fun to read, probably, is whether or not it's well put together and well produced. Because yeah. if you, you know, if it looks like it's can't sit on the shelf next to something from Penguin, Penguin Random House, then it probably doesn't read like something that you would read from Penguin yeah. Random House. It's got to have both aspects of that together. How, how important, I mean, we're talking in, in indie publishing, of course, but I mean, how important is um, uh, the perce that perception? Like, you know, do we need to fool people into thinking that we're published by Random House? I mean, how important is that? Well, my, my opinion, right? Everyone's going to kind of bring through. But that's I, why you're here. You're here yeah. for your opinion. That's that's fine. That's all I got. That's all I got. Um, and and in some conversations that I've had in the past 20 years, but I would say, of course, I mean, there's, it's not, you know, do people judge a book by the cover just to say it, like people judge a book by its cover. And um, I assume that in addition to being writers, the audience are, you know, you're also readers. And when you yeah. see something, and if you don't think it looks professionally done, you probably don't pick it up either. Yeah. Um, not, you know, it's not like we're trying to fool them into thinking we're Penguin Random House. It's that we're trying to show them that we are professional in the work that we do and that right. we understand the business that we're in. Um, yeah. So they should stack up. Like, yeah. And they and a lot of independently published books do. Like people people do get this right all the time. So it is something that yeah. can be it's, done. It seems like it's getting a lot better. I mean, I remember, you know, I started self-publishing back in like 2006 and there were still a lot of questionable covers uh floating yeah. around out there and there still are to this day let's just face it but it seems like it's gotten much better oh, much I mean, have better. you seen a progression uh at all we have a um award program at ivpa called the benjamin franklin awards yes and after the benjamin franklin obviously the first printer and publisher yeah though some say um and absolutely through that program, the books that come through. And, and also that program has been growing year after year. So more and more people are entering into independent uh, independent book award programs. And then, yeah. yes, and the judges tell us that all the time, that the content is looking better and better. Because they, I also think, I mean, the Internet fixed a lot of that, too. Because now, yeah. you know, before it was kind of people on their desktops and just kind of winging it. And now there is a ton of information out there to help people figure out how not to wing it. So if you yeah. wanted to pay attention... Uh, you could, and I think you can do it. So the quality has gotten a lot better, at least at least on the outside of the book. I don't crack every cover to yeah. read actually in the book, but yeah, they look pretty good. I mean, it is a start if it if it looks good, yeah. then it, you know, inside and out, then at least you know they took the care to do that. So hopefully, they applied that same care to the writing. Hopefully, <laughs> and that's why I get a little bit frustrated. And people are like, it doesn't matter. It's it's about the content, and I'm like, You're, they're not even going to get there. Like right. Even go. Of course, it's about the content. I want them to read it, but not. They won't. They won't take that journey with you. Right. Yeah. I mean, if the orange skin is moldy, you're not going to eat the orange, right? So, 
That was very good. Very good. I might steal that one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, steal away. I'm a writer. I come up with those on an hourly basis. <laughs> um, so uh, you guys, you mentioned uh, lots of resources out there, and you guys have some resources uh, on your site uh, aimed at that. What sort, what sort of resources do you offer? Well, like you said, IBP is a pretty big organization. So mm -hmm. um, we have oof, we've got a, a lot of education in the form of webinars. We have our own podcast. We have a conference that we put on every year, um, yeah. a magazine that we publish. And then we have all of the articles that go into the online database that you can search. Yep. Um, we've got resource directories. You can go in and find out where who are all the distributors and wholesalers in the industry, if that's interesting to you. What are the different bookseller associations that you might want to connect with? Um, we do, we have a members discussion forum. So if we don't have the resources, then you can kind of just talk to other members and ask them what they think about stuff. And, and to be honest, a lot of Amazon questions flow through there because we don't have, all, who knows, I can't even begin to try to talk through all the different nuances of what makes a really stellar kind of Amazon sale. I don't, it's beyond me, but there's a lot of people in membership who are pretty versed at that and they yeah. talk to each other about it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And we also offer member benefits if you want discounts on things that you're going to need for your business. We have a bunch of that stuff, too. Oh, very nice. It, uh, and I assume there there are some like membership dues uh, that people pay to join or there are. Right. Uh, Nothing's free. But thanks for, yeah. point, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, it's a touchy thing uh, with some folks, but, you know, we should discuss that because we that's part of the overhead of being an wow. author, you know. Yeah. Author publishers mm -hmm. pay one hundred and thirty nine dollars a year for membership. Well, that's not bad. That's mm. actually pretty, I think, pretty reasonable, um, considering everything you just said uh, yeah. that you guys provide. So I used to um, be, um, I used to, so I'll, I'll, I'll preface it by saying I lived in New York City for like probably almost yeah. 15 years, 12 or 15 years. And when I first got this job and they said, it's 139. And I said, oh, that's like dinner. So I was like, yes. <laughs> and everybody was so like, no, don't, you can't. That's not. That's a good point, though. <laughs> It is, yeah. yeah, the the a dollar value shifts from you know region to region within the United States. Yeah. So but that's a very I, good point. <laughs> I don't live in New York City, and that isn't dinner really necessarily across the yeah. country. But yeah, no, that's true. Hundred thirty nine dollar dinner here in the, the Austin area is a that's that's quite a bit. Yeah, nice dinner. Quite depending on where you are. Uh, and I would like, by the way, for Draft Digital, if you're all listening, to take me to $139 dinner. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking at your site, and I, um, I've i spotted the um, IBPA Publishing University. Uh, what, so what is the, what's the story there? It looks kind of like a conference from the mm -hmm. screenshot. Is that what it is? 100%, yeah. It's, okay. um, it is our annual conference. So we oh, okay. posted it, I think, oof, what did it? 20 plus years. We're going to be 40 years old. So it's probably, IBPA wow. is going to be 40 years old. So it's yeah. probably in its 30s at this point. And it's, um, you know, I struggle to, to say like exactly how it, what it is or how it's structured, but oftentimes people, people want us to give a theme for the conference. And I always yeah. really push against that and say, we don't have a theme. Our the oh. vision of this conference is professional book publishing. And it's just That's what does it take to professionally publish a book? So we do all of that and we talk about it at different levels. But, you know, we never really come up with like this year we're going to talk about the supply chain at this conference. So, yeah. um I think that that's helpful because every time you go, you're going to be able to really learn about the publishing industry again from the beginning to the end, but at a different level as you kind of come into it. And of course, we're going to talk about the hot topics of the day, but the hot topics of the day aren't really going to move your business forward practically at all times. So we need to talk about the practical stuff. Yeah. The, that, that foundational stuff that yeah. doesn't necessarily change from month to month. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So, yeah. It happens every year. This in 2023, it'll be on Coronado Island, which is a little Island outside of San Diego. In case you wanted to go on a vacation. Oh, okay. This, the, the next one is. Yeah. The okay. Next one. yeah. Okay. Yeah. The last one it says was in Orlando. It was. A, yeah. That seems to be where uh, most author conferences end up at some point is Orlando. <laughs> well, I mean, it's inexpensive. Yes. <laughs> you know? Plus, it's a good excuse to take your family with you and do a whole yeah. Disney thing afterward or whatever. Absolutely. So, yeah. That would be great, too. What sort of things um, 
if some when someone comes to the conference, you, you're saying it's like the the roots, the foundations of of publishing. You know, what kind of experiences can people expect to have? Um, it is in that practical learning, some experiential as well. So you can come with your own projects and, and have some advancement specifically on the thing that you're working on, because uh, we do build into the program some things that will ask you to workshop stuff experientially. Um, there's a lot of camaraderie. I think one of the things about independent publishers is they're very, very willing to share with each other and they share very openly. And uh, that's a lovely thing, I think, at the conference. So it's not just the thought leaders that are brought in to, to kind of, you know, share the space, but the community itself is very collaborative. So you get the, you get that kind of rolled into it as well. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you have a lot of um, industry spokespeople showing up and doing talks and things. I'm trying to get... Have we, have we been there? Has Draft Digital been there? Yes. I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm just asking. Well, Smashwords. Um, Smashwords. I know that you just... Yeah. And so yeah. this past year was the first year and uh, you came with Smashwords. Smashwords has been sponsoring the conference for years and years. Yeah. And, and uh, has been a really strong partner. And Draft to Digital is starting to become one as well. And we're really, we're really happy about that. Yeah. There's a lot of... There's a lot of sponsors that are there, so it's also a great opportunity to talk to vendors. Yeah. It would be helpful. Well, you. I mean, now that Smashwords is part of us, we, we you oh. know, we're get, we're learning more. It's not that we didn't know you existed. I think there just was, we were ships passing in the night sometimes. I think absolutely. There's a lot. I mean, there's so much. There's so much happening. Yeah. It's really how could you? I it, yeah, I couldn't. Yeah, that. Uh, yeah. That yeah, uh, the industry is like that. I mean, just. We talked about the shift from you know when you guys started to now. I mean, so many things have changed in just the past two years. Like, how mm -hmm. have the past? You know, just let's just not skew negative at all. That we know that there was an, a a major event that happened over the past <laughs> few years. But how have things uh, changed for you guys in that time period? Yeah, on the positive side of things, um, uh, I think when people kind of got back into their homes that and or uh, you know got a little bit more on the personal free time, they yeah. must have started publishing themselves because our membership just blossomed. Um, yeah. A lot of people came on board. I think a lot of people looked around and tried to reassess what are they passionate about? What do they really want to be doing right now? Yeah. And a good many people want to be writing and publishing if, if they can be. So um, we did see a spike in the membership and in the a number of educational, um, number of people that kind of started to join in on the educational programming, um, which I think is great. The, because, you know, people are going to publish anyway. Hopefully when they do so, they join an organization or connect with partners like you guys that will help them publish well. You um, both. So, yeah. I mean, we're free. So you, you don't, yeah. you know, there's nothing <laughs> yeah. to risk there. No dinner. Uh, you have to... No dinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have, uh, we, you know, the amount of money you would spend with us is equivalent to the amount of money I was spending on dinner in college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. With the, with yeah. the you took to the cafeteria. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, well, I had a question in mind and it has blown right out of my head. So instead of me trying to flounder and get that, um, I've got a couple of people who've asked some questions in the comments. Um, Roderick asked, this was in regard to the, um, that book publishing standard, uh, that you, you guys said, do you need to be a member of the organization to get that? Or is that a, a download people can get? No, you can get that for free. Um, if, if you're on our website, there's a tab called resources. And if you go to the resources drop down, you'll see a couple things in there. Um, and one of them will be this uh, standards checklist, I think it's called. Okay, good deal. I thought I had a I had uh, set up a banner for that, but I don't have it yet. So I will I will get that. Um, See if I, yeah. if I've There's got a it. number of things that we, um, you know, we are a nonprofit trade association. We try to keep the dues low, but we also try to do like a lot of our articles are free. So if you go to something called IBPA Independent, which is what our magazine is called, you can get most of the content. That's a, it's about three, three or four months old, but still, you know, yeah. a lot of stuff is evergreen. Yeah. So we do a lot that will be free and open, and then of course some things that are about members and keeping the members in the loop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question, IBPA pub U is great. My opportunities to learn many opportunities to learn. Sorry about that. Uh, Jim, uh, will the 2023 conference have a virtual option? So that's, it's hard. I'm going to say this in like a really roundabout way that the, the 
Clean answer is no. The conference itself at this point in time is not planned with a virtual. We've done that. Last year was virtual first and then a physical yep. conference. And the year before that, it was all virtual. Um, we think that what we do with our virtual programming is we have we have a monthly webinar. We have a monthly member roundtable and we have a monthly podcast. So every month there's three different things you can do virtually with IBPA. That is virtual education. And what we're hoping is members will kind of pick up on that and roll through that. So we're going to actually make all of our PubView online webinars free in 2023 to members, free to members. Okay. Um, it's kind of like a way to do that. It's, And then I will be, I'll show you, I'll pull the curtain a little bit and talk a little bit about, because I'm very interested in how organizations are going to work the virtual and in person and how that space will be. It's, it's not the easiest thing to pull it's off. Not, it's virtual. not, it was, it, I know everyone rushed to it because of necessity, but um, I, we've watched so many conferences just go under, Yeah, uh, you know, it, it just couldn't replace the in-person stuff. The yeah. in-person stuff is so key. And I, I remember like even way back in the day before it was just an option for us to do this. And you had to like travel to a room and sit in the meeting. And sometimes you'd have a conference phone on for people who wanted yeah. to dial in. And yeah. that was like literally as good as you could get. But there's a lot of accessibility that comes with the video stuff. But there's a lot of also good stuff that comes with in person. Yeah. So we don't want to lose it. And I... I'm, again, I'm hopeful that the online programming that we do all year long will be kind of pub you virtual. Yeah, and, uh, there won't be like a co-located virtual component for this. Well, do you, do you record the live conferences and and make those available to people after the fact, or we've done in like podcasts, so okay. we don't do video, but we've done audio of the presentations before. Yeah. Okay. All right. But so it's, those... a, it's a weird world we're in, like everything all the time. Like, yes. You know what I mean? Like I'm yeah. I'm not not there, but I'm also a little bit like I guess you could listen to it, but let's go. Like if you if not everyone can go, but if you can go, let's go. Yeah. Exactly. Uh there is something I mean, uh, just real talk. I mean, when I go to so I've done a ton of both virtual conferences. I've spoken at at all, everything you can imagine. And the 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 in-person conferences is just a different energy. Um you get responses and feedback for one, you know, I, I, I hate doing the, um, I'm going to give my presentation to the void and let, <laughs> and with no feedback whatsoever. So, and you get more out of it when you're, when you have that kind of two way, cause I can respond when I see that people in the audience are not, you know, clicking, I can change my tack and, and maybe, uh, take questions or whatever is needed. So anyway, that's a whole other topic. We can yeah. do conference talk some other time. Okay. <laughs> you gotta have both. You gotta have both. So aside from uh, the conference and the uh, the resources uh, that you guys offer, what 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 would you say is the biggest benefit to people uh, being a member? Well, they, they are, we do surveys, and so they tell me. So I don't. I'm, okay. I, I don't. So you're not having a guess. You know. It up, <laughs> yeah. But it, so the and it's interesting. The very first thing people say they like is our is the magazine. So that's everyone's okay. favorite reason to be a member of IBPA. And we still do a physical magazine, and we fill it with great content that's developed by the members. And yeah. um, you know that still ranks number one. And then number two is always the connection to other independent publishers. So the ability to feel like you have someone to talk to um, and not just them, but the office, you can always call and somebody will answer the phone. Um, we don't have recorded services. We have people that answer and ask what they can do to help. And I think that's getting to be more and more unique yeah. as, well as organizations get bigger and bigger. We have that in common, Draft Digital, yeah, real just, live humans, yeah. It's just like this weird thing that you did. I don't understand why that's going away. I know it's a lot easier, but it just makes such a difference to to call somebody. I get so annoyed when I try and make a reservation and yeah. people wants to help me, but I'm also old or then I used yeah, to. Yeah, well, same here. Uh, and I, you know, I'm that guy who yells back at the robot voice on the phone. Like, yeah. that's, that's not what I want. <laughs> now they're texting you. Like sometimes <laughs> I call to, to do like make a, hair appointment or something and they'll text me back and I'm thinking what is going on um so 
you know, but to get back on point, it's the uh, the connection <laughs> to the people, yeah. and not just the office staff, but the other members too. I think independent publishing can be a very lonely experience, yeah. you know, working alone a lot um, and time, trying to find your network is hard. And uh, hopefully we can, we can help a little bit with that, but that, and that's what they say, the magazine and the networking. Okay. The magazine that is, I think kind of surprising in this. It's day surprising. Yeah, yeah, it does. I, yeah. We even just had somebody on Twitter yesterday or something. The magazine drops the top yeah. of this month and people are like, they take pictures of the cover and they're like, I got my magazine. And oh, wow. <laughs> Get your selfie in. So, right. and, and in this next, uh, in your September issue, uh, there's actually going to be an article from uh, our, our guy, Jim Azevedo. Oh, great. I think. I, I believe, yeah. He's here. He can he can confirm. But yeah, you guys are in there, and there's uh, yeah. That's the thing I like about the magazine too is like it is written by people in the industry, yeah. for the people in the industry and members and our partners like Draft Digital and Smashwords, are contributors to the magazine. It's not like there's some think tank that's pushing all this down. It's like member to member communication. We have a committee that develops the content or thinks through what should be in it. Yeah. Um, and it, it does surprise me and I'm happy and I'm glad that it's in print and people are so excited about that. Yeah. Um, that it takes me back to um, like when I was a kid or when I was a teenager, you know, when I was first starting to experiment with being a writer, you know, it was those kind of publications that were the ones that, that really got me going, you know, and it's so geeky and like specific. Yeah like yeah. the independent publisher. It's like, yeah. what other magazine? I mean, there are some other magazines that are out there like that, but there are a few. There's a yeah. few of us kicking magazines around that are just about independent book publishing. And uh, yeah. it's great. What do you think is the, um, all right, we're just going to assume that you agree with me that independent publishing is better than other publishing. 100%. Um, <laughs> I'm bored. What do you think it is? Like, what? Wh why is that though? Because I mean, certainly people have a dream sometimes <laughs> of, I want to be a random house author or whatever. Um, and they have a particular, usually a particular, we'll say daydream about what that, <laughs> what that looks like. Uh, but what, what makes the whole independent publishing scene in your mind better? If you even think it's better, you can correct me. I'm, I think I'm it's, fine. I mean, I, I, it's hard. So yeah. I think one of the dream, the, the dream, and I think you were kind of leaning into that a little bit there too, that it is a bit of a dream when you like, you, but you think yeah. that getting in, in the big five with a big five publisher, things are going to be easier because they're going to take care of everything and they're going to take care of a lot of things, but they're not going to take care of everything. And you're still going to have to do your marketing and it'll still be difficult. Yeah. But on the independent publishing side, you, you, you're not just the author, you're also the publisher and you have to do all of those things really, really well too. Right. So it's not, um, but I still think it's great and can be better. And I th think one of the reasons is just the ways in which it's taken down those gates. Yeah. And I, I, it's, I don't know, sad, sad seems a simple word for it, but publishers today are drawn a lot to the big money and the big checks yeah. and the big advances. And if you are like an entry author who has a great, great, great story, but you don't have a track record and you don't have a lot of social media and you don't have huge following, it's, it is difficult to come in through that space. You can definitely find independent publishers to work with in that space a little easier. And I recommend that of course, because we're the Independent Book Publishers Association. We've got a lot of those mid-sized and large independent publishers there. But if you have a great story, the idea that you can still bring it forward is, it, it, I love that idea. And I also love how it creates a lot more diversity in our industry and, and a lot more voices that we have available to us to listen to. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's there's no accounting for bad production value. <laughs> you have to do it right. well. And I think I've harped on that a lot lately in this half hour. Um, but you can definitely be in the game. You can be in it. And, and that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and really, if you're willing to put in the work and the time and the the energy, you can not only be in the game. I mean, you can you can play with the big players. Uh, you can. You, you yeah. Right, so, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to ask, like, you're, but you're publishing, writing, yeah. publishing, doing all mm -hmm. of that too. And um, what do you think about the? I always say you need a lot of books. You need you need to keep writing, keep writing, yeah. keep writing, keep publishing a lot of books. So that it's hard is my to key know. strategy. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Yeah, because um, there's marketing, uh, but marketing is is in a way kind of competitive. 
meaning, you know, you hear this. And when I go to conferences and I was actually going to ask you about this, but like you, what, what authors are being told now is even if you have that traditional contract, expect to do a lot of the marketing yourself. Yeah. Right. And the thing is, there's only so many places we can market books and there's only so many ways that we can do that. So we have to get really creative. And what I found was um, kind of the problem, I guess, uh, the the roadblock in a way was, you know, once you've done all the marketing things, that's as much as you're going to be able to do. Now it's time to push a different switch. And that switch for me was write a lot more books. <laughs> so I, I think I, you're right. Yeah. That's interesting. So, yeah, I do think you kind of hit the end of that road and then maybe you rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat yeah. and, try and think about it that way. But it is scale. It's not just scale for other publishers. It's, it's That's the reason independent publishers, capital I, have a business model it's because they're yeah. not relying on a single book to bring in the revenue for them. They're, you know, and they're finding readers for different books. Like, obviously, yeah. as a single author, your books are going to be probably similar. Like, you're probably not writing like dark noir and also soft romance. But maybe you are. I don't know. It could be. We're about. It could but, be. Yeah, but you're. But you have a lot of content out there anyway. A lot of different yeah. um, touch points for readers to find you. So they may right. never find the marketing for this one book that you did, but they might find this other book or somebody else gave it to them. Yeah. So, and that's the origin, I think, of that adage that your your best marketing tool is your next book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and that backlist idea, like the the deeper your backlist, the easier it is for people to discover you. When they do discover you, there's places for them to go. Um, so there's a there's this idea in the traditional world that the mid list has disappeared. The mid list authors. Um, are you? Cause my theory, and I and I, it's not really a theory. I know this as fact, actually. But most of those mid list authors went straight to indie publishing and hybrid publishing. Are you seeing a lot of that in your organization? A hybrid publishing is exploded. I mean, there's yeah. no other way to explain it. And maybe I did, well, definitely hindsight. I should have mentioned that too. Like what, what are some changes we've seen in the industry recently? High republishing for sure. And also along with that's definitely confusion in the industry related to what is a hybrid publisher versus a service mm -hmm. provider and authors that are getting kind of taken advantage of in some cases, having wonderful experiences in other cases. It's, it's yeah. a real interesting new newly developing segment of the market, not not new at all. I mean, authors yeah. subsidizing some level of their publication is old as publishing it yeah. goes back and every publisher does it. So to imagine that this is a, a new business model isn't true, but it's certainly emerging in a way that's really interesting. And I think it's just had an evolution, that's you know? Yeah. yeah, it has, yeah. And in the middle of a kind of a, another phase of it too, because authors are getting more savvy. So they are now understanding when they're, actually not working with a hybrid publisher, maybe they're working with a service provider, which is a wonderful right. thing to be. And we support publishing service providers and they're really important to have, but it just got to be really clear about what you are and what you're not and what you're doing, what you're not doing. Yeah. And authors are becoming capable of kind of making those distinctions, which is cool. When you say a uh, uh, service provider, describe what you mean by that. You're not talking about like a, like a draft to digital or something. You're talking about like a a vanity press type thing or or, or maybe yeah. i'm off well i don't i don't i don't even use that vanity anymore okay. because i think that term is so outdated and who i i agree it's just what people know but kind of like yeah that's what i mean like yeah. I, I think these are pay to play you pay to play yeah there's yeah. no and also they're not going to give you any guff about yeah. anything you want to do so, and, and I think that the, the tension and kind of those pain points that come between the author and the publisher yep. are important and they should be there and not like, you know, excruciating pain where you, you know, you can't get up <laughs> the next day in the yeah. morning. You should have some tension in that relationship. They should be telling you, advising you and make almost making you pick the right subject headings for the book, make sure the cover matches the genre types yeah. that are out there. Um, get yourself registered, you know, in the ways that you need to be registered. There's just some professional publishing kind of boxes that you need to tick. Yeah. And some providers is kind of going to let it flow. And those are good too. Those are great in our industry because there's a lot of authors that really just want, know how to do it and want it to flow. They don't actually exactly. want stuff. They want, or they don't want this. They already know and they want to 
they want to get it through. And so the, if they're working with a service provider and they are kind of taking on the role of the publisher themselves, yeah, that's helpful for them. Yeah. So, that's the, I think the point yeah. though, is that there's a, there's a flavor for everybody. Like, you know, what, however you, whatever way you want to go, you can go your own way. Uh, yeah. You know, be but cautious. Be cautious <laughs> and educated. Yeah. Because the biggest thing I think that the biggest hole I think some authors fall into is thinking they have one thing when they have another. And so and neither one of them, I would put a stigma or call either one of them vanity. I wouldn't go in that space for any of these business models. They're just yeah. options and opportunities. But if you really don't understand what option or opportunity you're getting into, you will maybe not enjoy the experience. Yeah. Um, but midlist also authors are definitely going there. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's the answer to that's the cool. query. A hundred percent, because publish big publishers aren't investing in them. Right, and I mean, why wouldn't you go that route? Especially if you were kind of lucky enough to get your backlist back, which some are. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them have to fight for it, but I mean, a lot of them are. But I mean, mm -hmm. it's crazy. Uh, I, I don't know. It's crazy. I will. I've watched this. I see this a lot with folks who attend Nink, for example. Um, mostly romance called? writers. Nink, uh, Novelist Inc., the conference in Florida, uh, Tampa. Um, and uh, they're mostly the folks I encounter there are formerly romance writers who got their lists back, you know, or fought to get them back. And now they're going, you know, full on indie or doing something hybrid, but, you know, they're blowing up because, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have 40 books I wrote for, uh, you know, Signet Romance or something. And now, you know, every time I release a book, I, I another thousand people discover my list. You know, it's amazing. I mean, that's yeah. meaning in the, what you said before would be prolific. Yeah. Thing. Like have more books, you'll get a bigger fan base through more books. Um, yeah. It's interesting to hear you recommend that because I'm going to be honest with you. When I talk to most people, in the, in the industry, uh, that is not their recommendation. But then again, most of the people are kind of coming in from a more traditional standpoint and you've been working with independent publishers. So is that what's influenced your perspective on that? People in the industry don't recommend that authors write. Have mo lots, of <laughs> lots of books. Is that crazy? I mean, that to me, that's, that's crazy. Interesting to me. I mean, yeah. which they recommend against series. That's what I hear the most. A series. Sure. I mean, if you have, that much of a story you know this, yeah. that's that's a big long that's a long 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 that's story. a commitment and if you're a traditional publisher you don't necessarily want to invest in something that has no completion date necessarily so i could see it what is that guy that was did the game of thrones and then yeah. i know, know. there you go i'm yeah. embarrassed that i can't say it out loud but isn't it like <laughs> not even done yet it's still, not even done yet. The show is done and everything's done. And he's had not, not one, but two television series. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's still, he still hasn't written the final books. I so, know. You know yeah. He'll be okay. I know yeah. they want series. I mean, they want to, um, distributors will do that to you too. Like they won't work yeah. with you unless you have, a, because they're, they're betting on the future. And there's this right. huge learning curve with getting an author up to speed in, in yeah. a publisher for a publisher and for a distributor. So they want to know that you have more. Um, I know they want series, but I'm interested. It's, that's interesting to me that they don't care about. I was just mentioning to you before this that I was reading The Four Winds. I just yeah. finished it last night. Uh, gosh, and I won't remember this author either. Kristen, somebody in the audience might. Someone Kristen, can tell us. If you're in the audience, The Four Winds, uh, who is it? Google yeah. It. So good. Let's all Google it. But I mean, you look at her page, her, and it, th this many novels. Like she's written yeah. like 15, 20 novels. And right. They're basically the same novel, kind of, but they're, you yeah. know, it's. But see, she's got a formula, so, she, you know, and people like it and people, people like, want it. Yeah. They want to cry. You want a good yeah. cry. That, the, those books will do it. They're really, yeah. really sad. I, I, I wonder sometimes if I did a, not a disservice to myself. I mean, I, my books have done well and they're series and mm -hmm. I've got multiple series. But like I, I wonder sometimes if I would have enjoyed, I enjoyed all of it, but would I have done better and enjoyed it more if every book was just standalone on its own? You know? Well, good thing is you still can do that. I like, still have time, yeah. You do still like this whole writing future ahead of you. So and you I could, could, we're saying write more books, write more books. I mean, I might as well. You can write a couple standalones <laughs> and see how they do. Um, yeah. It's just really easy for a reader if they like one to jump to the next. Yeah. In a series, so I, I get the why that's good, but 
yeah, whatever, whatever you need to do. Like yeah. if you don't have a series in you, then just write the next standalone. Right. Me. And do you think? Booker, oh, no, no, yeah. go ahead. Well, I was just going to say the Booker Prizes long list came out a couple of weeks ago or last yeah. week. And we had a book on there that was 116 pages, yeah. the shortest book ever. Yeah. nominated for the booker and i was like is that a novel like what is that it's 116 pages but that's you know seth godin says the the nature of a book has changed you mm -hmm. know and um you know with ebooks that's really true i mean you know you can have an ebook of literally any length and uh well maybe maybe there may be an upper limit there uh not that i'm aware of but you know print books there's a bottom and there's a top and that's that's what well, you're going to have to deal with. You're dealing with production <laughs> costs and the cost of paper nowadays. Right. Um, absolutely. But don't you on your Kindle or whatever reader you have, look at your little like 17 minutes to go and you're just like, oh, yeah. well, you know, if it had like 572 hours left to yeah. go, I might put the book away. So yeah. some, level Depending. Of, some level of done is good. Those books you read, you don't read that all at once. You know, you, <laughs> that's, those are the books you read. Uh, every time you go on vacation for the next five years, oh, yeah. <laughs> those exactly. George R. R. Martin books, you know, yeah, that are exactly. 200,000 words plus. Yeah. Um, I'm looking through and, and uh, we're not getting a ton of questions. We're getting a lots of favorable comments um, oh. about you, your organization. Uh, Anthony says, I just followed IBPA on Twitter and most importantly, click the notifications. Thank you for this webinar. Uh, you're welcome, Anthony. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's an interesting, this is, this can kind of lead to a question. Um, so Burnett asks or says, I've heard it's hard to build traction when all the books are different, especially different genres. Do you think that's true? I do think it's true. I think it, well, I'll use the word harder. So, I mean, it's I think harder. that's where all of this advice comes from. The series is very, that's, that's all traction. Right. Um, books like the, it's in the Christian Hanna. It's Kristen Hanna. Gosh darn it. Did somebody know? Someone is supposed to, I know at least three people in the comments who should have mm. looked that up for us by now. <laughs> so that Look at you, Lexi Green. <laughs> <laughs> that is, so that's an example of an author who has, like I said, like 15 or 20 novels, but they're basically yeah. the same thing. You know, I think like Nicholas Sparks for ladies, if you yeah. will, you know, or maybe Nicholas Sparks is for ladies. Um, but that's easier but I don't know authors who can write cross genre really well, to be honest. Really? And maybe there's there this audience will educate me, and there are a lot that can do it. But I think when you get, it's such a different thing. Each thing, it's such a different thing to understand. And the readers, I think, it really depends on how you're going to divvy up genre. Because I think, um, for example, like I've written science fiction and fantasy in my early career, and then I started writing like thriller novels right mm -hmm. well i still think of the thriller novels as basically science fiction just they're just contemporary mm -hmm. so they're it's a little easier to bleed over into those genres that makes total uh, sense yeah, yeah. but I switching from say sweet romance to um <laughs> the dark noir yeah something like that might be a little tougher not saying it can't be done I agree. There, there are certain tropes that kind of flow through those. So yeah, I mean, I, and I guess you'll, you'll know it if you can do it. And of course, some authors are just amazing and they can cover all the things, but I, the traction question is true because you get a readership readers kind of flow in genre too. So you get a readership yeah. in a particular genre. It is hard for them to cross over. So these are all considerations. I know do some readers, um, do readers follow authors more than genre or more than series? I don't know. That's a very particular thing. Um, I, Everyone in the audience should come chime in. I follow authors for sure. Yeah, I definitely. do too. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. Very interested in what's new. And I'm, you know, I think readers who are at the level, I think we are probably all at in terms of our readership, yeah. and how much we read, uh, we're interested in them. They're like our, we're fans. Yeah. So, yeah. We follow off. We definitely follow authors. So yeah. Most of the, I mean, uh, John Grisham, you know, I read all of his legal thrillers and then he's, he's written some like, uh, I don't know what you call it, more literary fiction stuff. And I like that. Uh, and he wrote uh, the, the whole Camino Island. There's just two of them right now, but he's written those. And I'm like, those are fantastic. I mean, so I think the guy could write like, a, you know, a soup label and I'd probably <laughs> give it five stars on Amazon. I love uh, it. So here's a question. This is Jim Azevedo. He's my ringer in the audience. Uh, he says, hi, Angela. Can you talk about the different IBPA committees? 
I think they help set the organization apart. Well, that's, yeah. So we are a membership organization. Um, so as a trade association, we are in our bylaws, we are built by the members for the members. So we're run by committee for the most part. Um, the biggest committee we have is the board of directors in terms of their strategic setting. They set all the strategy for the association, but we have a number of member committees that anybody in the organization can join through an application process. I mentioned one, which is the committee that develops our magazine. Yeah. So a lot of the things that, you know, are IBPA, are IBPA because the members developed yeah. them. So they developed our magazine. They develop our member benefits. So we have a member benefits committee, a group of people that decide what discounts we should offer on what types of products and programs. Uh, we have an advocacy committee that decides what points of advocacy the association take. Um, and uh, we have, gosh, one more, oh, a DEI committee, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, which is really about kind of spreading DEI through the entire association and make it pretty systemic in the things that we do as opposed to picking up just different and particular issues in the association. Yeah. So we have four of those, we, you know, we have other standing committees, but everything is done by committee. So if you like facilitating conversations, then your job is trade association work, <laughs> then you would be well suited to a job like mine, because most yeah. of what we do is just talk to big swaths of people to figure out what the right thing is for the majority of IBPA members, and then put those initiatives into play. Oh, very good. All right. Well, um, we're kind of, we're at the end of our time, uh, which caught me by surprise when I looked up and saw that. So uh, you've been wonderful. I'm really appreciative. Can you hold on a second, just one second, because we have to run a little spot here toward the end. Uh, and I'll, and I promise I'll come back to you and we'll wrap up. Okay. All right. So here we go, everybody. Take a listen at this. Ebooks are great, but there's just something about having your words in print. Something you can hold in your hands, put on a shelf, sign for a reader. That's why we created D2D Print, a print on demand service that was built for you. We have free, beautiful templates to give your book a pro look, and we can even convert your ebook cover into a full wraparound cover for print. So many options for you and your books. And you can get started right now when you sign up at drafttodigital.com slash print beta. All right. That guy has such an amazing voice. I, I love when he comes on. Uh, so anyway, uh, so we are at the end. Thank you so much, Angela, for being a part of the show. I, I think your organization is amazing. Um, and I think it's very reasonably priced. Uh, you know, just one small dinner in Manhattan. Uh, but we'll have to send more folks your way. And I'm looking forward to in the future. Now we'll, we're we're going to start branding some stuff D to D at your at your conference. Let's do it. That I'm looking for. I'm going to have to show. I want to. I want to talk. I want to talk to your folks. Wonderful. Someday. Thank you. This has been really fun, and I, I appreciate all you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, make sure that you like and subscribe uh, wherever you are. Probably probably YouTube. Most of you seem to be on YouTube. But anywhere you are, uh, type in that URL slash draft digital. You'll probably find us. And if you do, like and subscribe. And make sure you are sharing this show uh, with your fellow authors. And make sure you bookmark d2dlive.com because that's where you get a countdown for every single week's episode. Uh, so again... Angela Ball, thank you so much for being a part of the show. Everyone else, thank you for being a part of the show, and we'll see you all next time. Take care.